viene la migra. Bienvenido a su programa Trucha Time. Welcome to your bilingual immigrant rights program, probably the only one in the country, known as Trucha Time. Why? Not porque viene Trump, porque ya llegó. Okay? Uh, Trump, trompetas, is upon us. His policies will become law. People indicate to me and to everybody else, what's he going to do? Don't you know what he's going to do? He's going to do what he said he's going to do. He's going to round up people. Uh, they're going to get rid of DACA. Now, what does DACA mean for members of our community? What does DACA mean for families of our community? What does it mean to have your work authorization uh, revoked? What does it mean to have had the opportunity for the last three, four years, you're a young person, to realize your dreams, to start working, to start getting scholarships, and then all of a sudden that being pulled out from under you. That's what we have explored. That's what we will continue to explore this program. Today we have a couple of very special invitees. We have with us um, Estefania Rubalcaba, verdad? And they call you Stephanie or Estefania? Steph. Steph. Okay, Steph. Also with us is um, is Laura Bustillos, a documentary filmmaker from Juarez, El Paso. Ni es Juarense ni Paseña, sino Juapeña. <laughs> fronteriza, una Fronter mujer fronteriza. Eso, muy bienvenida. Gracias, gracias. Okay. Vamos a empezar un, una charla entre ambos, pero como siempre quiero darles conocer los cambios en las leyes, lo que existe y no existe. Cada vez que hay una revoltura de esta naturaleza a través de los años, we have seen very concretely people in the community take advantage of people and start selling legal work or doing legal work for things that don't exist. So off the top, uh, from the beginning, let's put it out very clearly. There is no new law. There is no new pardon. There are no new measures in place to replace DACA if, in fact, Trompas gets rid of it on January 20th of this year. What is going to happen thereafter? Well, interestingly, there's two bills in the Senate that attempt to address this. Now, when, because I'm not going to say if, but when Trump revokes DACA, the first question is, do I lose my work authorization even if they revoke my DACA on the 20th? Does that mean my work authorization that I have maybe for another two years I can't use anymore? We don't know. We don't know if they're going to grant the kids, the DACA recipients, that type of grace, period. But in the mean, my sense is that they're going to revoke everything, okay? And what's going to happen thereafter? We'll get into, I think, uh, certain scenarios that that uh, our DACA recipients can can anticipate and can exercise rights with. But right now we have two bills pending in the Senate that were introduced uh, December 9th. One is called the the Bridge Act, uh, sponsored by Senator. Schumer and uh, Graham and um, and Durbin, and it's called the Bridge Act. Bar Removal of Immigrants Who Dream and Grow the Economy Act. And that bill would be a bill that would be created to deal with the DACA kids, period. Nobody else. So there's a debate. Should we push for one bill for one group of people, or should we wait or a, a, a buildup of, of, uh, of a broader comprehensive immigration reform. The debate is always there whether to do it or not. I think we have an exceptional circumstances. I, I favor anything that advances anyone in our community. We are, we're never going to get it all, but I think we have to have a holistic approach to this. Now, what this new DACA would do, it would make it a law and replace DACA, which is an executive action signed by the president over a law. And what that would do 
it, it, would, it would grant kids or DACA recipients a provisional presence for three years, okay? It would be pretty much the same, uh, same requirements. Those DACA eligible people who had not filed could file under the new law. Uh, it would allow, it would of course disqualify people with, uh, with uh, convictions for even, even a misdemeanor. And so basically it would make DACA as it exists into a law. That's one proposal. The other proposal is by a senator from Arizona known as, as um, uh, 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 Senator Flake. And what that would do, it would incorporate the changes of the Bridge Act or the old DACA along with several new law enforcement provisions. What we need to understand, for example, the first amnesty bill from 86, we used to call it the bitter with the, the, bitter with the sweet, is in order to get amnesty, we had to accept the sour, the sweet with the sour. And the sour was employer sanctions and increased law enforcement. Some people got fixed. We got screwed permanently with those changes. That same framework exists in the SAFE bill where they're going to say three years provisional status, um, work authorization, can live and work and do whatever you want in the country so long as you've never been convicted. However, the SAFE Act has certain law enforcement provisions where they would put in $100 million dollars for more agents, uh, 100 new temporary judges, and uh, 21 new, uh, uh, 100 new trial attorneys or prosecutors to start deporting people. Moreover, if you're a DACA kid and you got arrested or a DACA adult, then you would be taken to immigration and there would be what we call mandatory detention. Even if you're not convicted but were arrested and sent to jail, so what, what we're seeing really is certain elements of, of, of the Republican Party or the anti-immigrant community to start using the tragedy that has, that has, that has, uh, that has incorporated or engulfed our community and our misery and our desperation as a way to further screw us by creating mandatory detention. You want to fight your papers? 5,000 cases with three judges, maybe we'll get to you next year. And so it really becomes almost a permanent prolonged detention destined, created to discourage you from pursuing your claims. And so there's a series of real horrible law enforcement provisions um, that, that would allow people to be, to be locked up for long periods of time. And uh, at the other thing that it would do is it would have the, 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 the filing fees would increase drastically, um, and it would rush immigration court proceedings and make the judges resolve your case within 90 days, no matter how complicated your case is. So they would be mandated by law to, to violate your rights. When you're in court presenting a case, what matters is not the clock, but the Constitution. And so for that reason, there's, a, there's an uproar uh, by the, by the, immigrant, by the uh, legal community as well. And so those are the type of things that are happening. Those are the type of things that are happening uh, in the Senate. And so there are two competing type of, of bills. Uh, one could help us. Now that's assuming it passes, because if it passes the Senate, it still has to go to the House. And then after the House sends it to a subcommittee, uh, to committee, the Senate has to do the same thing and then have a joint committee meeting to, to, to decipher and resolve the differences of the bills. So it's a complicated process. So even if they passed it, we're going to have kids with nothing possibly from January 20th for another maybe till the end of the year, best case scenario. And so what do we do? What do we do? What does our community do if it's revoked? What is Plan B? And um, to 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 discuss that, we have Steph uh, Rualcava, a uh, charming, intelligent, bright, 
energetic, articulate. Oh, you're going to have to do good, girl. Uh, a young lady in high school who I had the pleasure a couple of last month at a town hall meeting sponsored by Congressman O'Rourke and the Border Network to hear her very, very um, eloquently lay out her story. So again, Steph, how are you today? Um, I'm doing good. How about you? Good, good. Nostas um, Just a little. <laughs> okay, great. What high school did you go to? Um, Del Valle High School. Okay, when did you come into the country? When I was three years old. Yeah, who did you come with? My mom. Uh, just you and your mom? Yes, sir. Okay, and you're the, are you the old? Do you have any brothers and sisters? Yes, I have two brothers. How old are they? One's 12 and the other one's 6. Okay, and they were born here? Yes. Okay, so that's kind of typical, you know, mixed mixed families. Now, <clears throat> where where are you from? I'm from Gomez Palacio, Durango. Okay, and is that where your mom's from? Yes. Okay, and uh, what brought you guys here? Well, my mom wanted a better future for us, so she just decided to come here. Okay, and did she go to Juarez first and then El Paso or directly to El Paso? Um, the, she bought a house at Juarez, and then we moved here. Okay, and what grade school did you go to? Um, now? No, well, when you first came. Oh, well, I, I went to, um, <laughs> well, I started pre-K. But which grade school did you go to? ¿Cuál primaria aquí? Oh, well, I first went to Hillside, and then I moved to Liberian. Mm-hmm. Now, you're 17 years old, and you're a senior at uh, what high school? Junior at Del Valle. Del Valle. Okay. Now, when did you, when did you first know that there was something a little strange in the house? De tus papeles. De que no debes andar hablando mensa en la calle. <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, I always... What's your first memory of that? Well, kind of, I always knew because I stayed in touch with my grandparents. And then, but it was kind of, it didn't make me feel so good because I was, at first, I was, like, really excited I was part of this country. And then to know that I'm not really from here, it really, like, shocked me. When was that first awakening? Um, well, when I first went to school. That you mean, like, in the first, second grade? Um, Pre-K. Because all my friends were like, oh, I'm from here. And then I was like, oh, I'm from here, too. And then... Um, I, I asked my mom, and she's like, no, you're not. I'm like, oh, well, it's okay. I, st- I still feel proud of being here. Now, did were there instructions at the house to, to be careful with what you say? Well, um, not really. I just kind of assumed, my, I assumed by myself that well, I felt embarrassed at first. And then I was like, I'll just not say where I'm from. And then I just, I was like, no, I have to be proud from like where I am. And st- I'll, like all my friends think I, I was born here. And when they recently heard that I went to go speak at the, with the congressman, they were like, oh, you're not from here? And I was like, no, I'm not. But if I, if I had the chance, I would be from here because this is where I was raised. This is where I was, like, I spent my whole life. Now, what, uh, what activities are you involved with at school? Well, right now, mm. I'm in soccer. We just started the season. We're going to um, have our first game soon. Um, I'm the captain. I'm also in student council. I'm the press box manager. And... Um, almost all my courses are AP. And what, uh, what, what are your dreams? Well, I just want to be in architecture, and I want to go to UTEP because it's going to keep me close to my family. And, but then if they take DACA away from us, I'm going to have to pay for college. And I was trying to be the best I could to not, to not make my mom pay for it. So I could get scholarships, but then if I get that removed from me, it's gonna feel like if all my hard work was for nothing. Now, you you still have a work permit? Yes. And when does that, that expire? Um, 
I believe, in, within one more year. Well, yeah, because of the, the work permits at this point are for every two years. And so that becomes a, a dilemma for you and for, and for our other kids, which is it's revoked. Again, DACA is revoked. We don't know if it's going to revoke that or not. Do you have a driver's license? Not yet. Okay. Right now, for example, uh, last week we had a, a member, an attorney from the Texas Civil Rights Project out of uh, South Texas uh, join our program from, L from Laredo, and they have a lawsuit going on against the state of Texas because what the state of Texas is doing to, your, to you, to your, to, to your compadres, is that, let's say you're, 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 you go to get your license for the first time. What DPS, Department of Public Safety, is saying is that no more because this is going to go out. And what the Texas Civil Rights Project is arguing and we're educating people is that that's unconstitutional. They're making, they're, that's against the law. They're making decisions of something that doesn't exist. It hasn't been revoked yet. And not until the employment authorization is formally revoked, it's still good. And from the very beginning in this project, many kids were, were being denied, and you may have heard of some of this, a driver's license because they would require proof that you live here when you presented your employment authorization. But the employment authorization is proof in it of itself along with your driver's license. You don't have to show anything else. But they were only doing it with kids. So the system has a way of, of, of attacking particular groups of people in a very bureaucratic way that, that appears to be following the rule of law. Somos el rule of law. Tienes que seguir las leyes. But if you go to this office, es una ley, vas con la otra, es otra. So those are things to be on the lookout for. 577-0750, 577-0750. We're here talking to Steph, um, a, an extremely bright representative of our community, someone we want to inspire and, and, um, and follow in her efforts to continue her education in spite of what's happening. Okay, now let's talk about te quitan la, la, la mica, el permiso de trabajo, el 20 de enero. ¿Qué hacemos, mica? Um, have, have we thought about this? I mean, that's part of what this project is about, is to find out what we're thinking and then to offer maybe some solutions. Well... Are you going to be able to finish the year, you think? Um, I, I think... I would, but it would be harder for me and my family. And in which sense? In the sense that I couldn't be able to work anymore to help my mom. In the sense that I wouldn't be able to get a scholarship and I would have to work even harder. And especially for the for the career I wanna take because it's really expensive. And well it was just simply and since I like to travel a lot because I play soccer and we go on tournaments, I wouldn't have that experience anymore. Okay. Now, the, you've been here more than 10 years, okay? And without getting into your, all of your family's legal status, is it in your situation, counseling you is counseling thousands of people that are listening to us. You have a defense against deportation. Let's assume the worst case scenario. This is part of this program is to create plan B. Okay. Plan A ya sabemos. No más es cuestión de cuándo. Que duro nos van a pegar, no si nos van a pegar o no. And so the question becomes, what do we do? Every case is different. You're in plan B. There's something called cancellation of removal. If you've been here 10 years, person of good moral character, and can show hardship, exceptional hardship to your mom if you had papers, then you can ask for a a permission to stay here and get a work authorization. It's a defense against deportation. Uh, those who have seen violence could, be, could ask for a political asylum. So there are other defenses, and part of this program was to look at that and to say, now this stuff is upon us. Well, now we're going to start looking right now that we're fighting for DACA and work authorization. But Trump trompetas is upon us. This thing is going out. As, as sure as God made little green apples, 
he's going to wipe away the executive action. How, when exactly the specifics, we don't know. But the thing is for people is not to panic, not to go back to Mexico, uh, not to quit school, especially if you're in high school. Uh, the law requires, even if you don't have papers, to continue working in, um, I mean, continue attending school. Now, how many, um, have you identified other people in your high school that have your, in your situation? No, people, sir. people, people don't go around talking about it. Mm-hmm. Tienes papeles. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not like a no, no tengo papeles club. <laughs> it's cool, verdad? <right? laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't imagine. But the question would be, Steph, is that I think that mm, I'm so happy that you're here because um, I think without you guys organizing and without you guys pushing us, and that's where the Dreamers movement started, uh, kids came out and says undocumented and unafraid. You know, and so at this point, what ideas do you have or would you have for reaching kids in high schools. Let's say we created an organization and we wanted to reach the kids. How would we reach the kids? Leaflet there after school, or free beer after every football game, and you know, or, or, como la ves tu? Um, what do you mean? To reach out to people. To say, let's say we have a high school organization of dreamers, and we want to have a meeting at your, at your school. You know, do we leave it outside? Do we talk to one of the counselors? You know, how would we reach the organizations? Well, how would you reach the organizations? First, we have to show them that we're not scared, that we, we're, we're here to support each other, and we have each other's back, and do some, we may create a safe environment for them, because many of us are scared to come out and face, face um, bullying. So therefore, we would have to come out strong and show them that we're here for them. Now, when you say facing bullying, does that mean, to me, that implies or suggests that in the past you have been subjected to bullying or you've heard people in your shoes being bullied? How did that manifest itself? Como, como la veías? Um, well, Some examples. For example, there's in elementary, there's always been this since I play soccer, there's always been this English versus Spanish kids, and it it's all starts since we're little that they teach us that being from somewhere else, it's being different isn't good, and well, they call they they call my friends beaners. They call us all this stuff just because we speak Spanish, but then they don't think about it. We know more languages than they do, and that makes us a better person. Now, was that a conflict with Anglos or with other Mexican-Americans who don't speak Spanish? Um, well, both, actually. They think that just because they speak English and they speak, it, they speak better than us, they don't have an accent or anything, that, that just makes them better. And I mean, well... It's just not about about the accent. It's just about how how you why you're here and what you're willing to do to stay here. Five seven seven zero seven five zero cinco siete siete. Five seven seven zero seven. What's the phone number? Zero siete cinco There you go. There you go. Se me acaba el inglés y español. Hablando de los idiomas. Sí, así es. Hablando de idiomas, vamos a presentar a, a Laura Bustillos, que ha estado muy atentamente escuchando a la señorita. Uh, Laura Bustillos, ¿quién es usted? Eh, ¿Prefieres español, inglés? ¿Cómo te nace, mi Well, I guess I'll speak English and then uh, we can go to Spanish. My name is Laura Bustillos Jaques. I am a documentary filmmaker, a storyteller, artist from Ciudad Juarez and uh, from El Paso as well. I've, I, I spent, I've probably, I've probably spent half of my life in Mexico and half of my life in the United States. So as I told you earlier, I'm a mujer fronteriza. Now you went, uh, you started your formal education in Juarez, right? Yes. And when did you enroll in school here in El Paso? 
Um, I th- think it was sometime in middle school. It was right before I think the violence really took off. Um, I think my parents maybe had some sort of. I mean, I'm not sure why they made the decision. I think I was too young to really realize why, but um, I was 12 or 13 uh, when my family moved to to El Paso, and it wasn't the easiest transition. It wasn't easy at all. I actually identify with a lot of what you're saying, like a lot of this bullying and just feeling really um, like an outcast. Even though I'm, I, I was just, you know, born in the city next door, they, I still felt like an outcast. So. And uh, where did you go to school? Where did you go to college? Um, I did my undergrad at Brooks Institute in Ventura, California, and I have a master's in film. I did the David Lynch master's in film in the Midwest. Um, actually, when I went to do my master's, I was going through a... I was going through a sort of two-year immigration limbo. I had an encounter with the law, and um, my it, it put a red flag on my immigration case. So for two years, I was waiting for a decision. And, and um, in those two years, I really explored what it was like to be from the border region and, and to be a storyteller. So that's when I found my voice, and... While I was still without a legal status, I decided to apply to this uh, David Lynch Masters in Film. I think a couple of hundred people applied and only 15 people got in, and I was one of them. Oh. So I decided to go for it. I said, okay, it's in the Midwest. I'm going to go. Si me dan la visa o no. Y si no me la dan, tienen que ir por mi hasta allá, no? So anyway, I went and some miracle happened. I don't know. But I got my, my green card in the mail shortly after I went to do my master's. I was in Iowa, you know, I was in the middle of nowhere when I got it in the mail. So I'm really grateful for that. And now um, I can now apply for U.S. citizenship. And um, you were talking earlier about the fees increasing tremendously. I mean, um, the citizenship, the application for citizenship is doubling after December 23rd. So that's what today Today? oh my goodness yeah so i mean ni me dieron tiempo de aplicar realmente porque en noviembre fue cuando nos avisaron sí sí y cuando cumplí los cinco años para poder aplicar no entonces you know it's i feel like it's um it's it's very easy uh when things are uncertain to to get lost in that and to sort of like get I, I mean, I have to be real, I was really depressed when I didn't know what was going to happen to me. But I think when, when you're able to, to channel that in a creative way, um, you can really make a difference in the community. Now, <clears throat> one of the things, uh, you said you found your voice. And looking at your bio, it indicates that you're, you can you consider yourself a documentary filmmaker. Have you made any documentaries? Yes. <laughs> I've made a... Um, a few short documentaries and um, I'm in the production of Undocumented Freedom which is a documentary series so for now I have the first episode which is TV length uh, 27 minutes and working on other projects now so have have you shown uh, Undocumented Freedom? yes yes Um, we actually premiered it in Ciudad Juarez It was really important for me to premiere it in Juarez and not a highly renowned film festival just because I'm from Juarez and the protagonist from my film is also from Juarez. And and I thought, well, okay, a really nice festival is going to screen it in like New York City or L.A., but who is going to bring it to the community that needs it the most? Me. So at that point in time, I was able to cross to Mexico finally. And... I was able to, to premiere it in this um, middle school, Secundaria Estatal 3042, and it's really in the outskirts of Juarez. And um, that was a premiere, but we've had other really nice. Uh, how was how was screenings. it received? What's the storyline? The of the documentary. Yes. Oh, okay. Well, it's a undocumented freedom is is a documentary series about what it feels like to be to be an undocumented immigrant in the United States. So, I follow um, uh, Beto 
and he is a he's now 28 29 and we follow him as he lives in the shadows of the law i mean the guy had um he 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 was he would have qualified for daca but he got in trouble with the law like he had a drug um um he had a felony so he got deported and then came back and and so we follow him as he as he's back you know and he's not supposed to be here or he wasn't or i don't know i mean that's really up to the viewer to to real to figure out if if he's supposed to be here or not because he was in um he was in phoenix arizona and he was a victim of <laughs> sheriff arpaio's uh from my opinion unjust um enforcement yeah. enforcement so i mean he is he was uh pled guilty to an aggravated felony which he really didn't commit and just because he wasn't born in the United States he was immediately I mean he served time and then as soon as it was over they deported him so so it's a really complex story and on top of that he's he's gay so it's it's really contra he's a really controversial character and and it's been really exciting to follow him because uh, you made a joke earlier when you said no tengo papeles club right oh. and when i met him i no tenía yo no tenía papeles and he <laughs> didn't have papeles so <laughs> so we became friends and and we connected over any you know we be, we just clicked <clears throat> we just clicked and then as our friendship grew I, I shared with him hey you know this is my situation and he said wow you know i have a very similar situation so we, we, we started the Nothing of a Bellis Club. <laughs> you know, one, one other project that you had mentioned that I found very uh, interesting is that right now you're working as a freelance uh, filmmaker, artist, Ventes uh, Tamales, Menudo on Sundays. <laughs> sí, los domingos. <laughs> lo, Le soy el número de teléfono ahorita. Lo, lo que se requiere. <laughs> but you said you were working on a project with a national organization of dreamers. Tell us a little about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, well... You know, I make a lot of uh, projects with independent artists, local artists. Uh, Juarez El Paso. I've just moved back from New York City, so you know, I've, I collaborate a lot with artists. But now I'm. How doing, long were you living in New York City? Um, for about a year on and off. Uh, I've been traveling back and forth, um, working with an attorney there. Working on your film. Yeah, on my okay. film. She's, okay, she's sort of giving us legal advice, and she's a character in the film as well. Um, but now, to, to answer your question, I'm now working with uh, an organization called Define American. And Define American it was founded by um, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Jose Antonio Vargas. Uh, he came out as undocumented, and for this article, he won the, the Pulitzer Prize. So he has started this organization, and, and what I do is uh, go through their story bank. So they have they have a whole story bank of migrant stories, and I go through all the stories, listen to all the stories, read all the stories, tag them, organize them, and I mean, I, it's a really um, enriching job that I have right now because it really exposes me to the diversity that is um, the immigration situation in the United States. I think us being in the U.S.-Mexico border, uh, we're mostly exposed to Mexican-American stories and maybe some Central American, you know, and South American, but working with Define American has exposed me to stories from all over the world, really. Now, in, um, in your reviewing of hundreds of these interviews, do you find... Um, What's the difference and or similarities between our stories of our immigrants, of our DACA recipients on the border? Is there anything with Fronterizo that makes it, makes it different? Well, I think, I think it's, um, it goes beyond being Fronterizo. It goes beyond being Chicano. I think it, it's more about being human. I think that there's a very fine line between being an immigrant and being a refugee. Um, and it's, I mean, why do people migrate? We migrate because we need better resources. We want better opportunities. We are endangered. Why does a refugee leave where they're from? For the same reasons. So, 
So I think that's what I've noticed that that migration is a universal thing. It's it's a human thing. The the history of migration is is the history of humanity, really. So that's what I've noticed is that uh, most all the stories really that I've been exposed to is is uh, are people who want a better future for themselves, want better opportunities. Five seven seven zero seven five zero. Let's go ahead take our first break and we'll come back and continue this conversation. Dr. Loco and the Rocking Jalapeno Band in a song entitled Mexican Americano. Uh, it's an old group from the 80s, uh, headed up by Dr. Loco, who was a PhD uh, anthropologist at Berkeley and, a, and, a, and a, an accomplished musician, and developed uh, a series of songs based upon the history of the movement in the Mexican community here but also one that reflected the reality. He has songs, for example, La Cancion Volver, 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 but they're very sophisticated music. But the way they sing it is return, volver, return, and then half English, half Spanish. And so it really raises the question of identity. You know, and, and what I, I find interesting in this historical period and now is that the, the DACAs, and, and maybe you can agree or disagree with me, both of you, is that it, it appears, generally speaking, that the emphasis of DACA for, for their limited purposes of getting documentation, which is admirable, is I'm from here. In terms of, right. it seems like, like the identity has been defined by legality, as opposed to then all these perennial questions there's questions that exist forever. Am I Chicano? Am I Pocho? Am I Pocho Cano? I mean, what am I? You know, during this whole, and for us on the, on the, in La Frontera, back and forth, which constantly be reinforced, it makes our area so rich and at the same time so flexible that allows us to experiment on a daily basis. But uh, how, how do you, how do you um, Steph, how do you see yourself? You know, because you, you and most of the kids, and I'm not putting it on the spot. I, I want you to think about it, and and, and tell us honestly, because it, it says, well, so, either soy de aquí o soy de allá. Pues las, eso es la India María, <laughs> ni de aquí ni de allá. You know, but the but the point is, is that you know, and that what created the Chicano movement, que rechazados aquí y y, y disminuidos en México, el primo pocho. When I give forums with my first cousins in Mexico City, and it's always on immigration and asylum and politics, 
Yo lo primero que hago es me presento como el primo pocho. <risa> yo soy el primo pocho de mi prima Leti, who's a real well-known academician. Uh, and I think it takes the winds out of their sails in the sense that, <laughs> y, y, you know, si soy el primo pocho, y, you know, and I, I don't think, and that's why I played that song too. When, when these guys are proud to be Chicanos, and then he says, ah, we're puro po pocho, si que. You know, so there's this reinforcement of, a, of an alternative identity, even maybe within the, the same family. For example, you have two younger brothers that are citizens, right? Yes. They have to have a different, how do you think they view things differently than you? Ellos tienen papeles, they didn't grow up with any fear. You indicated earlier, when you were a kid, you, you knew that you had to act a certain way. Well, what do you think of all this I said? Or is it too much from the old man? <laughs> <laughs> no, but you consider, for example, you, you consider yourself Mexican, Mexican-American. Uh, how do you think, how do your cousins, do you have contact with your cousins in Mexico? Yes. And when they come here, como, como crees que te ven a ti? Um, like if I'm a weird person. A weird in what sense? Do they have a word for you? Pocha? Yeah. Te dicen mi pochita? No. Con, con, cariño, <laughs> con, con cariño o, o you just feel. Pero tú hablas perfectamente bien el español, ¿no? Um, más o menos. <laughs> okay, so yeah. So I, I'd say you're leaning towards, you're on the pocho side of the thing. Uh -huh. Okay, <laughs> on, on the line. How about you? Well, oh, interesting question. I think for me, I'm still searching for that identity, you know? I, when people ask me where I'm from, I like to say I'm from Juarez. I was born in Juarez, I'm from Juarez, you know? But then sometimes, I think I've spent most of my life speaking English. So when I go to Mexico, I can, I can speak Spanish, but it's not the same, you know? It, si se escucha medio pocho a veces, no? And I think, for me, like I said, I'm still searching for that identity. I mean, I've, I've now reached the point where I can actually apply for U.S. citizenship, and that's become an internal conflict for me, especially in a country that would elect Trump as a president, <laughs> you know? It's like, do I want to be a citizen of this country or not? Do I want to be still Mexican? Do I want to have a dual citizenship? Do I want to give up my Mexican citizenship? I don't know. But I do know I'm from Juarez, and I do know that no matter how what I do, how far I get as a human, as a storyteller, or filmmaker, I'll always be from Juarez. So, yeah. No, that's, I mean, there's no, there is no right answer, no wrong answer. Uh, I had that conflict too, but I became, through my mother, because Mexicana, I became a, a Mexican citizen in 2000. And I served, I'm a Vietnam era veteran born and raised here, well, más bien en Juárez y en, y en mi mamá es de Guadalupe, Distrito Bravo, so very deep ties. And when I became a citizen in 2000, for the first time I felt how a Mexican must feel when he naturalizes. Era algo especial hacerte mexicano formalmente, porque los papeles, and I think I can identify with you, tener papeles, ser ciudadano de otro lugar que consideras el, lo tuyo es la, 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 la aceptación máxima. Ya eres parte de la comunidad. And, what, and I've been doing this work for a long time, but when that happened to me in 2000, I said, now I think I understand people sin, sin papeles. Is it, no eres, eres, pero no eres de la comunidad. Y cuando te dan ese permiso de trabajo, for the first time, it's coming out of the shadows. Do you agree with me, Steph? Yes, I do. Um, you know, what did the, how did you feel when you first got your first work permit? Well, I felt proud. I was like, well, I'm finally gonna be able to do something for this country and give it, give it something back that it's given me so many years. But you could do, you said earlier, you could do things that, that you hadn't done before, like travel with your soccer team. Yes. Yeah. You know, you know, one of the things, Steph, for you and your friends and for those who are listening, that's very, very important, and I think that's part of my role as an immigration attorney, is that 
it's probably easier to kill yourself and fix your papers than to say you're gringo and to fix your papers. If you make a false claim to U.S. citizenship, you will never fix your papers for the rest of your life, generally speaking. There's very narrow exceptions. And the problem that we've had in my office over the years are the staffs who go across the border when they can. Se ponen borrachitas con sus amigos, and on the way back they forgot their green card, and they say U.S. citizen. La muerte. And... Um, it's funny, Steph, because I, I had a kid like you who was going on a soccer tournament, you know, and they go through the checkpoints. And La Migra sticks his head in and says, all you guys citizens, and everybody screams, yes. So when this young lady went to fix her residency with La Migra, or actually with USCIS, U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, they asked her, did you ever make a false claim to citizenship? pensando que se estaba confesando con un padre soltó la sopa y dijo yes once we were going through la migra stuck his head in and we all said yes se la negaron wow. and she was married to a veteran who had both legs cut off you know as a vet and they and would they would there's no pardon congress passed the law so the point is false claim to citizenship is a no-no and i have to say it every program porque es, Algo tan inocente, ¿me entiendes? Se te olvidó algo y hablas especie. You know who are the candidates for that? The DACA kids, because they speak perfect English. Y cuando dicen U.S. citizen, they really, one, they can say it without saying American city, <laughs> you know, pero they can say it properly, and they really feel that it is, but the consequences are, are horrendous, horrendous. Um, how much time do we have? Six Nine minutes. minutes. Nine minutes, okay. In, in the last nine minutes that we have for both of you and for our audience, I want to talk about something that, that has reshaped our cities since 2008. To be very, very specific, March of 2008, when the conjunto Chihuahua, uh, the military, to wipe out or combat the drug cartels. Almost within four or five years, 100,000 people from Chihuahua have immigrated to El Paso. El Paso, which has always been like the fourth poorest city in the country, all of a sudden is booming here on the east side. Todos los negocios, toda la gente, todos los trabajadores are filling our schools and paying taxes and contributing to society. But the vast majority of those people are fleeing because of violence. And everybody has on the screen this model De que todos como antes venían a pedir trabajo. Nada más. Viene el hombre, se trae la familia. But the cases that we're handling are cases that deal with violence con familias enteras. 36 de Biomada, you know, 20 de Delicias, uh, 40 de, de Guadalupe. We haven't seen that type of flow since the Mexican Revolution in terms of entire families. And there's not a whole lot of attention put on that. And we have a lot of kids. And we had so much of that that we created an organization called Mexicanos en Exilio. Porque, because it goes to that question of identity. Y venían, pero todavía estaban preocupados por lo que está pasando en México. Entonces, el lema de la organización es, es exiliados, pero no olvidados. Mm. Todavía tienen su casa. Si no pagan el predial, se la van a clavar. Se las van a quitar, si no los oficiales, los ladrones. Entonces, todavía tienen un, un dedo en, en ese pastel. And so, violence is something that, that really affects us all. And one of the ways that it affects us is that sometimes people here are afraid to go back. That may be called political asylum. That may be a defense against deportation. And I'm not saying that that should be plan B or plan C if your work authorization goes out. But many people will, will not know or recognize that they fled violence porque se les ha olvidado. Have they ever hurt your family? No. Then 20 minutes into the uh, or, uh, interview, six first cousins have been murdered. I, well, I think that's hurt. 
you know, yeah. per, that's a permanent hurt. That's a whooping. And so, you know, one has to be aware that that political asylum can be a defense against deportation. And many of the kids that we have in school, some are DACA and some are also exiles. And so while the DACA kids were like exiles who have found a home and want them to accept them, the exiles of the violence have come over looking for a home that still hasn't accepted them. You know, so there are these subtle differences in our community and, and, and what's happening in Mexico is really, really um, um, devastating in terms of the internal displacement. But the number of people who are coming are coming for the, um, for the violence, as, as a result of the violence. Now, what, um, what experience, have you had any experience in terms of dealing with the violence in Mexico? Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I, I mean, I think what you're saying um, is an example of the violence culture that uh, we're part of. We feel it's normal. I mean, like you said, I, I think I've done that too. When they ask, oh, have you? No, not firsthand. And then think about it. And it's like, well, actually, yeah, my family members have been affected. I, so-and-so died. And so-and-so went missing. And we don't know this and that. And But we, I mean, yeah, to answer your question, yes. Yes, I have. OK. In, in Mexico and in the United States, I just, I just think that there's a really terrible violence culture that, um, that we're part of. And we have to, I think it's our responsibility to, to shift that, that it doesn't become normal. Uh, I mean, in Juarez, I mean, we have children who have grown up in, in the middle of the drug war. And they're orphans or, I mean, they grew up seeing this violence and it's it's normal to them so i think a lot of the work that i do uh, now in juarez deals with that social reconstruction it's very it's very important stephanie do you do you still have family in mexico right yes sir how often do they visit you here <clears throat> um well my aunt visits me from where the, where she lives in juarez or in durango um durango okay and how often does she come every like three months yeah Does she talk to you about what's happening over there no no yeah because most of the time it's just family connections and so there's i think a real lack of the educational system here in this community we should all be the experts on what's happening in mexico y no sabemos quién es el gobernador quién es el alcalde de juarez we should know that as well as we know who the mayor and the governor in the state of Texas, state of Texas are. And so nos, fal no, nos falta mucho, pero parece que trompetas is just building on, on, a, on a wall of ignorance that has been placed over the last hundred years in terms of keeping two communities very, very far apart. And unless, like you and me, make it a, a, a real effort to go and come. Yo me meto con los grupos de derechos humanos allá. Soy muy, orgullosamente estoy involucrado con muchos grupos ahí. Y nos los traemos, nos invitan. Y de esto se trata ese fronterizo. Así Hay es. gente que vive aquí toda su vida y no van para allá. Para nada. So, that's why we exist. Exist? Exist? That's, <laughs> that's after a couple of drinks. Uh, but... I think that is the, the purpose of Trucha Time, is dar el grito y decir, ya llegó el tiempo de ponernos trucha, Así de es. entender nuestras realidades, de apoyarnos y ayudar a los jóvenes formar organizaciones. Because to have a support group, to be able to talk about it, like you said when you bumped into your, the, the, the person that you're filming, you had that opportunity to share that. That's a support group. What is it to be called when you're a third grade? Um, um, somebody screams mojado or another one, y tú estás pasando. ¿Me entiendes? Eso cala. Yeah. Eso cala. Yeah. I, think, I think now more than ever, um, what I've noticed as a reaction from the artist community after the elections is, is that people are speaking up. So I think now more than ever, it's time to, to speak up. 
And to stop being quiet. And I think Dr. Martin Luther King agrees with that. Keep this movement going. Keep this movement rolling. In spite of the difficulties, and we're going to have a few more difficulties, keep climbing. Keep moving. If you can't fly, run. If you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl. But by all means, keep moving. Amen.